We've all been very inspired by Asagi, wanted to be a bit more like him. And recently, Dr. Apoli came to me with a fantastic idea for a video, a huge collab on the books that Asagi would read so that you guys can go away and do so and get the results you're wanting to get in whatever it may be. Everyone involved is listed below, but an extra special thank you to Apoli for the idea and the bulk of the work on this. Anyway, let's get started. You might have heard of The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, but before I go through it, let me ask you something. If Asagi had never gone to Blue Lock, how far do you think his football career would have gone? Regardless of whether he did manage to turn pro or not, I'm sure we'd all agree that he never would have reached the level he has. And it's kind of crazy to think that this alternate version of Asagi that never got invited to Blue Lock would have gone his whole life thinking I could have never reached that level when he absolutely could have. Two different outcomes for the same player with two different mindsets. This book really opened my mind up to just how far I'd been selling myself short in the past. And after listening to it again for this video, how much I still am. It talks about the importance of big thinking. Not wishful, where you just hope these big things will happen to you, but big thinking, acting and being in all aspects of life and the multiple benefits of this. Firstly, we have that unconscious cap, as we spoke about earlier. As another example, if you say, I'm going to run five miles, you're almost certainly going to stop at five miles, even if you have more in you. But also, when it comes to these bigger goals, I think it's way more motivating to think bigger and long term, because it's obviously more exciting to do anything when the end result is greater. Of course, Isaga aiming for nationals was already a pretty big goal, but aiming to become the best striker in the world brought out even more intensity from him. For example, if at the end of all those workouts it's just losing a bit of weight, you're not going to be nearly as intense and motivated compared to if you think at the end of them you'll have a superhero physique. And again, this book will fully convince you that you can achieve things like that in a practical way so I'm sure Jim Patch would approve of it too. A lot of people really write stuff like this off very quickly, but the existence of the placebo effect, that you can make a significant change to your body by simply thinking you will, should be all the proof you need that your thoughts often have a much deeper effect than we often realize. The truest form of change is identity change. This quote serves as the embodiment of not only how Blue Lock as a whole works, but Isagi as an individual especially. Atomic Habits serves as a guide to how we can reach any goals that we set and beyond, starting with the small details. Naturally, I believe if this book magically dropped into Usagi's lap, he'd have a mighty good time reading it considering how analytical and goal-oriented he is as a character. This book is all about relying on the proven research found in habit forming in tandem with one's mindset, instead of just using pure motivation to stick to good habits and help you rise to your goals. Like I said earlier, Blue Lock as a whole is representative of many major points mentioned in Atomic Habits, starting with Noticing When you set a task for yourself that requires some effort, say in this case, going for a jog tomorrow, just saying, I'm gonna try to go for a jog tomorrow, dooms the individual to purely relying on the hope that they'll be motivated enough to remember and do that task at some point tomorrow. Doing this lacks clarity, which requires you to have much more motivation than if you were to just implement your intentions. Saying, I'm going to go for a jog around the block tomorrow morning before breakfast, gives much more clarity and therefore provides much less mental resistance. Give your task a place, time, and purpose. Each task in blue lock leading up to each selection is carefully considered in all of these facets. Each task, especially the selections, is very intentional with when it is presented to each player and what aspect of a being a striker it practices. Wanting. The environment is crucial in molding what you want because it presents your choices. Say you want to eat less junk food every day. Well then, keep it out of sight in the very back of your pantry. Or stop buying it entirely. You won't have the temptation when the option isn't presented to you in the first place. Blue Lock demonstrates this well by literally making everything centered around soccer. You notice fairly quickly that the dorms are all literal blank walls with nothing but beds in them. There's nothing to distract each of the participants. Naturally, anyone would get bored of these rooms, so where can they go? To the only other places they can go. The gyms to work out, to the soccer fields to work on their technique, or the cafeterias where they can eat a hearty meal. Their environment literally gives them no other options than to hone their craft and work towards being the best striker the world's ever seen. And the last one I'll mention here, liking. 
The reason why anyone repeats behaviors is because we like the results. The best way to stick to long-term behavior is to give short-term feedback. Blue Lock demonstrates this well by not only allowing players to celebrate the thrill of striking a well-deserved goal, but by also updating their ranks after a game so players immediately notice improvement, giving them a beefy morale boost. These three rules and more are key in changing who you are and who you want to be. That's where the truest form of change lies. Isagi's goal isn't just to strike a goal, it's to be a striker. And the world's best striker at that. What's going on everyone, my name is Enemasu, and a book I believe Isagi Yoichi would read is The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Being a character who embodies a competitive spirit that thrives when adapting to challenges, this book would align perfectly with his mindset and journey of self-improvement. This book draws inspiration from stoic philosophy, emphasizing the transformative power of facing challenges head-on and turning obstacles into opportunities. For Isagi, who constantly finds himself in matches and rivalries that test his limits and demand rapid adaptation, the book's central message becomes particularly relevant. Holiday's insight encourages individuals to view challenges not as roadblocks, but as stepping stones for personal growth. Isagi's ability to adapt and change himself to fit different scenarios resonates with the stoic concept of leveraging adversary to fuel one's progress. By internalizing the book's teachings, Isagi could develop a mindset that sees challenges not just as setbacks, but as essential components of his journey towards mastery, and to be fair, he kind of already does. Moreover, the obstacle is the way it could provide Isagi with practical strategies for overcoming setbacks on and off the field. The book's anecdotes and historical examples of individuals turning adversary into triumph may serve as inspiration for Isagi as he navigates the competitive world of soccer. A good example would be his current rivalry with Michael Kaiser, who constantly has done his best to get under Isagi's skin. Despite that, Isagi mostly keeps his composure and even puts bias aside to learn what he can from watching Kaiser. This ended up actually leading to his awakening of Metavision, which we now see to be one of his most useful weapons. Ultimately, I believe that reading this book can empower Isagi to further embrace his new Egoist League status, viewing it as a unique advantage that propels him towards unparalleled success even in the face of rivalry and challenges. It's clear to me that Isagi read Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. At the very beginning of the series, we see Asagi's life before Blue Lock. In the most important game of the season, due to pressure from his coach and teammates, he felt forced to pass the ball when he may have instead gone for a shot. Clear thinking defines this situation as the social default, which is the force that inspires conformity, wanting to belong to the crowd, and fear of being an outsider. For Asagi, this action is more of a reaction, and not one he's proud of. So. After joining Blue Lock, he realizes his need to break away from the norm and go for what makes sense to him. As the book quotes, change happens only when you're willing to think independently, when you do what nobody else is doing and risk looking like a fool because of it. Isagi did end up looking like a fool, but with the help of Bachira, this change of heart became the catalyst for moving past the first selection. Sometimes all it takes is that first intentional step towards trusting yourself. Another sign of clear thinking was the way Isagi handles Quan's betrayal. In the match versus Team W, Team Z were winning in the beginning, and optimism was high all around. But after Quan's betrayal, when everyone else began to lose hope, Isagi remained focused and disciplined on the ever so small possibility of winning the match. This exa situation exactly mirrors clear thinking's retelling of Admiral James Stockdale survival at a Vietnam POW camp. After seeing many of his comrades die of a broken heart, he learned a valuable lesson. Never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. This concept of faith in prevailing, with the discipline to confront brutal facts, becomes the inspiration for Chigiri to kick into full gear for the very first time, tying the match. So, as you can see in Blue Lock, Isagi's journey emphasizes learning, independence, and the Stockdale paradox, which mirrors many of the teachings from Shane Parrish's clear thinking. Hey there, Suzel's here. So, The Player of Games is a 1988 science fiction novel by Ian Banks and forms part of the Culture series. 
The culture is basically an intergalactic socialist utopia, and the different novels revolve around the interactions between the culture and the inhabitants of less advanced civilizations. The player of games follows Jurna Gurge, the culture's most skillful board game player, as he's sent on a mission to a civilization whose entire society revolves around an incredibly complicated board game, with the best player being crowned as its king. But as Gurge discovers, there's a lot of darkness under the surface in a world where politics has become a literal game. I'm sure you can already see why I'm recommending this book to Isagi. His brand of football is closer to bullet chess than to the typical sports manga cocktail of sweat, grit, and teamwork. And just like in Blue Lock, the player of games highlights that everyone's playstyle reflects their personality and ideology. But more than that, there's a lot that Isagi might recognize from the player of games about being sucked into a vortex of madness, where an ordinary game suddenly transforms into an unfathomably high-stakes survival match. Certain aspects of the dystopian board game society might hits rather close to home for him as well. After all, the Blue Lock players themselves are slowly being commodified in a world dominated by wealth and power. That's what it means for Blue Lock to be the place where the game is the hottest in the whole world. Hey, it's Hush Reviews. Thank you for having me on. And boy, am I excited to talk about Blue Lock. To me, Isagi's the kind of guy who would do whatever it takes to get better at football. He would seek to acquire any kind of advantage, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem on the surface. After all, the only thing on his mind is becoming the best striker in the world, a title only given to those who are hungry for growth, for greatness. And so, I think Isagi would absolutely love and benefit from reading one of my favorite stories of all time, a 12-book fantasy novel series called Cradle by author Will White. Cradle is a tale about a boy named Linden, who at a young age is deemed unsold, someone whose soul is unfit to practice the sacred arts, which is the power system in the world of Cradle. For this deficiency, he is shunned by his peers, by his clan, by his people, and is treated as if he were worse than nothing. However, he and only he is shown a vision of the future, where his home is completely annihilated by an unknown, unfathomable force of evil. And so, despite all the odds, Linden must leave his home behind and do whatever it takes in order to save his people, to become one of, if not the strongest sacred artist in the world. Watching Linden grow as a sacred artist, as a person, is one of the most satisfying hype journeys I've ever witnessed. A journey that is quite similar emotionally to Isagi's. They both have that immeasurable, insatiable hunger to learn, to grow, to devour. Both Linden and Isagi start out as underdogs, but by harnessing their unique talents, sharpening their minds, and constantly seeking improvement, they start leveling up exponentially. Linden's training regime created by his mentor Aethon and Isagi's created by Ego both consist of the same intensity and pressure, that do-or-die environment that nurtures monsters. As Isagi competes with the likes of Rin and Baro, sometimes lagging far, far behind, sometimes surpassing them, Linden too has his fair share of exceptional rivals and opponents that push him to advance further. And so, since Linden's journey is complete, he would actually be a great example for Isagi to follow. After all, Linden is someone I think Isagi can deeply relate with, someone who's gone through the same struggles as he has, someone who has had the same doubts as he has, someone who aims for the very top, just like he has. For Isagi, it would be that moment of realization and inspiration that, hey, if this guy with all his setbacks, all his doubts, all his failures can do it, so can I. After all, there are many who embark on this journey to the peak of the mountain, but only a few who arrive at greatness. A book I believe Isagi would read would be the biography of Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. Now, most people know da Vinci from his artworks, but if you didn't know, he was a polymath and well-versed in multiple schools of human thought. 
from math, science, biology, botany, weaponry, you name it, Da Vinci studied it. But the reason why Da Vinci is such a famous artist is because he applied all the things he learned outside of art to art. With math, he was well-versed in geometry, understanding the way angles and lines and light work, which is why his paintings held such depth. From biology, he dissected dead human bodies and animals to figure out how muscles worked and interacted with each other. But the people in his paintings feel so alive and almost move as you move along his pieces of work. Isagi is the same when it comes to soccer. Everyone else has a singular focus of play. Baro wants to be the villain and hunt for goals. Shigiri wants to overtake you with his speed. Ren wants to be a puppet master. Kaiser has an elegant, prideful way of playing. But Isagi's different. He studies and analyzes everyone's way of playing, the way they think, their emotion, their ego, how they view themselves in the match, and he takes that and adds it to his own. It's why he's evolving so rapidly. He's becoming a student of soccer itself, not from how he wants to play, but from how everybody else approaches it. With Naruhaya, he saw Naruhaya combine getting in behind with his direct shot and failed, and he realized, wait, I can do that too, evolution immediately. With Baro, he realized, I can't make Baro work for me, but I can use him and the way he plays against everybody else to help myself score. It's an evolution. With Ren, he saw that people can become chaotic in a soccer game. I should always be prepared for chaos and react accordingly. Boom, evolution. Don't get used to how people play in the game. Always think they're going to do something you do you all expect. Each time Isaki does this, he evolves at a rapid rate because he's becoming a student of the game at a deeper level. He's not trying to play his way, he's trying to create a version of himself that can play and beat any type of player no matter who he's facing. Reading Da Vinci, he would be so inspired by Da Vinci's madness of going to these schools of thought, of abandoning art to learn other subjects but then coming back to it and applying things he learned outside of art. And Isaki could do that with soccer, to apply everything from the way humans think feel, move, breathe, act, and apply it to soccer, he would become a terrifying player. He's already competing with the best professionals. And even people like Kaiser are recognizing Isagi's becoming a dangerous player very quickly on the field. Now apply Da Vinci's way of thinking to Isagi, you have a monster in the making. Yo, it's J-Man, and I'm here to tell you why I think Isagi would read the four hour work week. On the surface, it may seem like Tim Ferriss's book it's just about working less and doing more fun stuff. However, there are a lot of fantastic principles in this book. The one that stands out to me the most is emphasize your strengths, don't fix your weaknesses. This concept is at the core of what makes Blue Lock, Blue Lock. It's so important that it's echoed in the first opening of the series. Isagi's team is filled with talented players. We have Bachura with his insane dribble, Kunigami's power shot, and Chigari's lightning speed. These attributes are their weapons, what makes them stand out as individuals. From the third episode, all the way up until the final concluding moments of the Isagi and Nagi versus Baro and Naruhaya match, we are taken on a journey to discover what Isagi's weapons are. What makes him different? Isagi has a lot of trouble with this initially. He gets so desperate that he asks his Burrow for help after witnessing Burrow's weapon during their match. This interaction is incredibly poignant because I can relate to Isagi's sense of desperation. He asks his Burrow, what do I need to be more like you? Not knowing that this was the wrong question from the start, Isagi's mindset is all wrong. He could never be like Baro. At best, he would be a cheap imitation. Ego even states, you can't just copy Messi. Isagi's journey is realizing that he has his own strengths instead of focusing on his weaknesses. How he isn't as fast as Chigori, or how he doesn't have a physique like Baro or a long shot like Kunigami's. He instead needs to focus on his strengths. This is a story I think we can all relate to, which is why I love the rematch he has with Baro. Everything finally clicks for Isagi. He knows what his weapon is, and from here on out, we see Isagi focusing on his strengths, which are his spatial awareness, football IQ, and direct shot. Hey, what's going on guys? It's Dr. Apolli. 
As part of this collaboration, I will be going over David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me. Can't Hurt Me is a self-improvement book about building indomitable resilience. This is very closely in line with the philosophy of Blue Lock. One of the things that stood out to me from his book was when he talked about the 40% rule. The 40% rule is the idea that when you get tired, you have actually only reached 40% of your maximum capacity. You see, your mind likes to play tricks on you and make you think that you're in a place that you really aren't. You can physically push yourself 60% further, but your mind is artificially stopping you. This reminds me of how in Blue Lock, all of the characters, when they're losing, unlock some sort of untapped ability unbeknownst to their previous self in order to win. It's similar to Goggin's approach of pushing yourself even when you think you've reached your limit. There's always more in you, you just have to dig deep and understand your incredible human potential. Beneath the veneer of weariness lies an uncharted expense of untapped potential. Goggins and Blue Lock highlight the fact that within the crucible of adversity lies the incredible capacity for self-discovery and triumph. Another thing that stood out to me is Goggins' idea of embracing discomfort. He says that when you feel uncomfortable doing something, you actively embrace whatever is making you uncomfortable in order to ward off that discomfort. The closer you come to your fears, the less fearful it becomes. It diminishes its potency, rendering it more palatable. By ardently confronting discomfort, one dismantles its intimidating facade. This is similar to when Isagi, after defeating Naruhaya and Baro, chooses to take Baro instead of Naruhaya. He knew that Naruhaya would be easier to work with, but he also figured that if he could utilize and work with Baro, that he would push him to become better than Naruhaya ever could. Thus, choosing Naruhaya would have been the easy path, but choosing Baro would have been the difficult but ultimately more rewarding path. Baro could have messed them up, but the highs that are possible with Baro on their team are much higher than the highs that are possible with Naruhaya on their team. The road that leads to mediocrity is broad and easy, but the road that leads to success is narrow and difficult. To even give yourself the chance at truly being the best, you have to climb down into the pit and grab happiness and success from the mud, holding onto it with the skin of your teeth, climbing back out of the pit covered in blood, with calluses all over your hands. If you want to be the greatest, you're going to have to scratch and claw and fight and grab and hold onto it for dear life. There's no other way. People who have been forced to go through and overcame difficult situations are better equipped to voluntarily put themselves through that. Goggins talks about his experience going through it, and Noel Noah is someone who had to go through it from childhood as well. They needed to in order to survive. The same fire that burns down houses can purify metal. Adversity has the potential to forge people, and it is through that that they can become stronger. This is similar to the very premise of Blue Lock. In the soccer dome, they're forced to improve their soccer game. It's like a cocoon. You're isolated, and when you evolve, you come out blossoming. So for yourself, if you're afraid of talking to girls or you really don't want to study for that exam, Goggins recommends that you lock yourself in, removing all distractions and external pleasures until you have faced your fear. In Blue Lock, they're in a soccer dome unable to do anything but live, think, and breathe soccer. This forces the players to get better and overcome their hurdles. And surely when they emerge from the dome, whether they win or not, they will become better soccer players. If you want to hear me talk about other things in this book and how they relate to Blue Lock, and if you want to hear me talk about other books and how they relate to Blue Lock, you can check out my video here.